a corrupted time scroll unravels, revealing a harrowing scene from the past. The fateful moments preceding Frieza's destruction of planet Vegeta, the lone survivor emerges with a steely resolve to alter destiny. He charges headlong into the sea of Frieza's soldiers. As Bardock grapples with the overwhelming onslaught, a vision of his son, Goku, flashes before his eyes, showing him facing off against Frieza. Strengthened by the image of his son, Bardock finds renewed vigour. Confronted by the formidable might of Frieza himself, Bardock's resolve only intensifies as he braces for the ultimate showdown. In a moment of clarity, Bardock is granted another vision this time witnessing Frieza's ominous transformation into his golden form and Goku's ascension into the legendary Super Saiyan Blue. Undeterred by the overwhelming odds, Bardock seizes his final opportunity to alter fate, unleashing a ferocious key blast aimed squarely at his adversary. Yet Frieza's power proves too great as his devastating supernova engulfs the planet in a cataclysmic explosion, obliterating everything in its path, including Bardock. Xenoverse 2 was released a year after the first game in 2016. Even though the game is almost a decade old, it still receives quite a bit of support from the developers with regular updates and DLC. It is available on multiple different platforms, but for this video I'll be playing on the PC using the Steam version. Xenoverse 2 is a direct sequel to Xenoverse 1, and while you don't need to know the first game's story to understand this one, it does make it a bit easier to follow. I do have a video that goes over the entirety of Xenoverse 1 story that you can watch, if you want. It is very long. As the dust settles and the echoes of destruction fade into the scroll, multiple villains are revealed. Among them stand Turles, the renegade Saiyan, Lord Slug, the tyrant of the Namekians, Toa, the vengeful scientist, and her reconstructed creation Mira, and Bardock, whose fate was twisted by Toa's manipulation saving him from Frieza's clutches only to ensnare his mind for her nefarious agenda. At Capsule Corp, a rookie time patroller, which is who we will be playing as, is conducting a secret investigation, when suddenly we receive a transmission from the Elder Kai, telling us that we have been specifically chosen for that critical mission, and we soar off into the distance. Two years have passed since the destructive events of the first game. Under the watchful eye of the Supreme Kai of Time, the Time Patrol has thrived. No longer tethered to the ruins of Toki Toki City, they now call the vibrant expanse of Kantan City home. Descending into its bustling shopping district, we are greeted by the Supreme Kai herself, offering praise for our selection for the enigmatic mission. We are then tasked with acquainting ourselves with the hub, while we set out in search of the elusive Elder Kai. The bustling streets of Kanton City are far larger than the original game's Toki Toki City. It is also way more enjoyable to navigate, thanks to the minimal loading screens and a captivating design. It has a great atmosphere and it actually seems like a place where people would want to visit and hang out. Unlike Toki Toki City, which felt ominously empty, the attention to detail in creating a vibrant and bustling city adds depth to the game's world it makes exploration more engaging. It's actually fun to wander around in this hub world. Tracking down the outer Kai near the portal to the Time Nest, we receive an invitation to partake in the game's tutorial. The best part about this is that it's completely optional. If you just want to figure out the controls on your own or have already played through as a different character, you can just skip over it. The tutorial is one of the strongest I've seen in any Dragon Ball game. It's quite solid. It covers all the basics of battle, asking you to take action against an opponent. All the while, it displays the button inputs it wants you to execute and provides clear feedback on whether you are performing them successfully or not. After some practice with each technique, it will have you face off against the opponent in a fight to ensure you can perform them during actual gameplay. Simple yet effective. It strikes a delicate balance, offering a comprehensive introduction without overwhelming newcomers. There are opportunities later on to take on other tutorials that will teach you more advanced moves. After gaining the approval of the Supreme Kai of Time and officially becoming a Time Patroller, we are thrust headlong into our inaugural mission. 
The Age is 761 and Raditz, fueled by Toa's dark energy, unleashes his wrath upon Goku and Piccolo. With his special beam cannon charged, Piccolo launches it towards Raditz, but he manages to dodge it and retaliate with a powerful key blast, landing a direct hit on the exhausted Namekian. The situation has become dire, as Goku finds himself on the brink of defeat, his energy waning against the onslaught of his own brother. Amidst the chaos, we make our perhaps tad clumsy entrance. Bro, I'm lagging! Bro, this game sucks! But with a swift recovery, we join forces with Goku in the hopes that our combined strengths will turn the tide of battle. If you're like me and have played Xenoverse 1, you may be thinking, wow, this is playing out a lot like it did in the first game. And you'll be right, it plays almost exactly the same, along with reusing cutscene animations and everything. And to be honest, the opening hours of the story feels like a copy-paste job of the first game. Now this is a bit of a spoiler for later on in the game, but it does subvert this expectation and I think it was done on purpose. I think? Together with Goku, we launch a relentless assault upon Raditz, each blow chipping away at his defense. While Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2 shares similarities with its predecessor, it has its own unique quirks to its gameplay that you'll need to get used to. One of the most important things is getting the hang of the basic movement system. You are able to run, dodge attacks and position yourself strategically in the combat arenas both on the ground and in the air. The fluidity of the movement controls coupled with the seamless transitions from dashing to attacking sets Xenoverse 2 far above its predecessor. Words scarcely do justice over how much of an improvement there is in the responsiveness of the controls and the overall feel, even though the two games pretty much have the same control scheme. Basic strike attacks consisting of punches and kick remain integral alongside the ability to unleash key blasts. By interweaving these moves, you are able to string together powerful combos to overwhelm on your opponents and even throw them aside when the chance arises. While the gameplay system may seem straightforward at first glance, delving into the intricities reveals a really satisfying gameplay loop. With Raditz weakening, Goku is able to grab hold of him from behind and restrain him long enough for Piccolo to drill them both through with his fully charged special beam cannon, killing them both and thus restoring the timeline to normal. I just love a happy ending, they're both dead. With Raditz subdued, we swiftly depart from the scene. Observing from a cliff in the distance are the nefarious Turles and Lord Slug, their malevolent gaze fixated on the unfolding events. Returning to the Time Nest, we are met by the Elder Kai, who praises us for a job well done, aside from our entrance of course. <laughs> He further emphasizes that the job of the Time Patroller is to help correct any inconsistencies that crop up in the timeline, except for the ones that the script says is okay. Okay? The Supreme Kai of Time then joins us and offers to escort us out to the bustling streets of Kanton City. In the middle of the shopping district, the Supreme Kai recounts the tale of the hero who had come before. She explains that the hero's actions were crucial in maintaining the balance of time and preventing catastrophic events. Their exploits were immortalized in a holographic statue. If you have an existing character in Xenoverse 1, you are able to import them into Xenoverse 2. Sort of. You don't get to play as them, but you will get the gear that they were wearing as well as their skills and some zeni. You are only able to do this once per save, so you will want to make sure that you have your Xenoverse 1 character equipped with all the stuff you want. Honestly. I didn't really care and I just imported them as is. Too much effort to go back to that bloody game. Not doing it. When I reached this point in the game, I genuinely thought that the character that you played as in Xenoverse 1 had died or something. Because this looks like a memorial you would have for a hero who died, but we will find out very soon that I was completely wrong about this. But who exactly are we playing as in this game? Oh, that's right. I need to choose someone for that special mission. Stepping into the realm of Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2, the game will first usher you into the character creation screen. From here, you are able to create your very own future warrior. Just as in its predecessor, you will first be asked to choose between five different races, Saiyan, Human, Margin, Namekian, and Freezer race. This choice is not merely a cosmetic one, as each race bestows unique advantages and traits that will influence their playstyle and combat effectiveness in battles. Additionally, each race also has its own set of transformations and special abilities that can be unlocked as you progress through the game. 
Marjan's boasts towering defense but slow stamina recovery, offset by a defensive boost at max stamina. Males have more health, while females prioritize endurance. Although I feel like this has more to do with them not being so fat rather than them being female. I love chocolate, but I can't eat it because then I'll get fat. But it's so good. Saiyans wield unmatched ferocity in combat, with powerful attacks but lower health. Males excel in close quarters combats, while females master key. Humans strike a balance between offense and defense, easily replenishing key and receiving attack bonuses. Namekians prioritize resilience with fast health and stamina recovery. Freezer race characters excel in speed and agility, ideal for hit and run tactics. Height and body type impact combat capabilities. Muscular characters excel in close combat, while more petite characters favor key blasts. Beyond physical attributes, you can customize your character further, from color schemes to scars. The game offers three choices for initial skills, but these don't affect stats. With a wide variety of customization options available, you can truly make your future warrior your own and tailor their skills to suit your preferred playstyle. And you can have multiple characters, which will share zeny and inventory, but not story progress. I'm not sure why this is, as you can still just replay missions from the time vault. My intentions with my character's appearance was to make them resemble my character from Xenoverse 1. The idea was that this was essentially the same person, but for those who already know, this was a bad idea. And also, I feel like my character is too short. Before we are able to continue with the story, the game requires that we complete at least one parallel quest, which can be activated by talking to the robots at the reception desk. But the reception desk is so far away. Well, thankfully, the Supreme Kai of Time gives us a vehicle to travel around the city in. It's a hoverboard type thing, and I'm really bad at driving it. But it is fast, so that means that it is good. There are other vehicles that you can get later on in the game, and by later on the game, I mean buying them with real money. Parallel quests have made a return, and they are so much better this time around. On the surface, they haven't seen that much of a change, but when you get into all the small additions, you realize how much less of a hassle they are to complete. There is only one parallel quest available at this stage of the game, but more and more will unlock as you progress through the story mode. And if you have any DLC parallel quests, you are able to play them once you have completed this tutorial quest. Up to three characters, including your own, can participate in a parallel quest. When offline, you can pick from the roster of characters that you have unlocked, or you can just play them solo if you like. You also have the option of playing as any of the characters on the roster. You don't need to worry about missing out on anything when playing as one of these characters, as all the experience and items they earn is applied to your time patroller. The right desk is for offline play, while the left desk will allow you to play with other players online. For this video though, I will just be focusing on the story mode and other single player elements. I might do a video on the online experience if enough people are interested and if I can be bothered. <laughs> Let's be honest, that's the biggest barrier. <laughs> but one thing that I will talk about when it comes to the online aspect of Xenoverse 2 is that the servers are far more stable and I don't even think I got disconnected once while playing. Unlike with Xenoverse 1 where it was a miracle if I could even get onto a server. <laughs> But Xenoverse 2's multiplayer lobby will time you out if you go too long without finding anyone to play with. Like I need any more reminders that I don't have any friends. Thanks Xenoverse 2, you're so nice to me. A parallel quest will usually have multiple areas that are joined together through portals. This time around the portal's location is indicated on screen making the stages way smoother to navigate. The scouter you are given also helps with navigation as well as locating items that you can pick up. It will also show the power levels and skill sets of opponents. And by using the scouter, I realized why I was having so much trouble when facing off against other time patrollers. You see, there is a chance during some parallel quests that other time patrollers will spawn that you have the option to fight. But many times I would go to fight them only to have my ass handed to me on a silver platter. This is because the game doesn't even attempt to match you against equal level time patrollers. This seems like a huge oversight and it essentially makes some of these fights impossible. Each parallel quest has a main objective that you must fulfill in order to complete it. There are also ultimate finishes that will trigger if you meet certain requirements, and this is guaranteed to occur, unlike in the first game. The overwhelming majority of the time, the objective will just be to defeat your opponents without a full team wipe. But there are a few different quest types. For example, there are ones where you must gather Dragon Balls while enemies attack you. 
but usually these just devolve into defeating your opponents and then collecting the dragon balls. I don't think I ever tried to collect them while they were still attacking me. Does anyone play them like that? <laughs> and these aren't the actual dragon balls that grant you wishes, these are different balls. The other balls are far more annoying to collect. You can find dragon balls as random rewards for defeating AI time patrollers in Canton City or in parallel quests. It's not as annoying as in Xenoverse 1, but it still is a bit grindy for my liking. And that is the basics of how each parallel quest will play out, which is pretty much exactly the same as Xenoverse 1. So you may be wondering why I like parallel quests so much better in this game. Well, there are two main reasons for this. First off is that the drop rates for items and equipment are so much more generous. In Xenoverse 1, you'd have to play almost perfectly and get a really high rank in a quest to even get a chance of getting anything good to drop. And even when you did play well, the game would give you bugger all most of the time and made playing through these quests such a slog because you'd have to play the same ones over and over again if there was a particular drop you were after. It was so bad that I just gave up halfway through my Xenoverse 1 playthrough. Since the drop rate was so low to get anything, I would just quit before I even tried because I had no hope of getting anything. I was so relieved when playing the first few quests in this game as I was actually getting stuff at a reasonable rate. The second reason as to why parallel quests are so much better in Xenoverse 2 is the ability to set the difficulty. Now for the early game quests this doesn't really matter as they have very low level requirements but where this feature is really great is if you have some late game quests for DLC. And like in the first game where you would have them unlocked from the start of the game but would have to either wait way later to even stand a chance at beating them or just incessantly grind low level quests. The easy setting allows you to be able to play these DLC quests near the beginning of your playthrough and actually stand a chance. It is actually this feature that really helps to alleviate level grinding so much that after doing a couple of them I didn't really need to do any more for the rest of the playthrough if I didn't want to. I did of course because it's actually fun. I got stuck in a vicious dopamine cycle. Now eventually you do have to start using in-game currency to use easy mode, but this doesn't happen until you reach level 60, and by then you won't need it. I don't really get why they start charging you for it, it should just remain free for everyone. Back in the time nest, another scroll has become corrupted, indicating there has been another change in history. Toa and Mira have set their sights on the age 762 when Vegeta and Nappa have invaded Earth. Tasked with aiding in the battle against Nappa, we confront the formidable Saiyan alongside some of the Z fighters, buying time for Goku to arrive from Otherworld. In many of the battles, you'll be fighting alongside AI controlled characters. One of my complaints about the first game is you had no control over the AI's actions, and this remains the case in Xenoverse 2. I get that this would be an inconvenience to implement because it would be worthless for the game's online component, but I believe they should have included a system similar to the Tenkaichi tag team where you could at least tell the AI who you wanted them to attack. I know, I know I mentioned the same thing in the Xenoverse 1 video, but I still feel the same way about this game, even if the AI is slightly better. They aren't so prone to doing bugger all during a fight. A sudden interruption disrupts Goku's return and Turles, another Saiyan that looks like a very tanned Goku, emerges to challenge him. Turles was initially the main villain in the Dragon Ball Z Tree of Might film. Turles worked under Frieza before founding the Turles Crusher Corp. He acquired the fruit of the Tree of Might, which grants immense power. With a desire for universal domination, Turles traveled destroying planets and gaining allies by consuming the fruit. His ultimate goal was to challenge Frieza for control over his galactic empire. The Turles Crusher Corps assisted him using the seeds of might to grow the tree on Earth. However, Goku was able to defeat him. Turles prefers shortcuts to power, using the tree of might rather than traditional training. His arrogance and desire for revenge against Goku led him to ally with Toa. Also, Google Docs keeps trying to change his name to Turtles. And it is really annoying, even though I added it to the dictionary, it's still like, did you mean turtles? I'm like, no, I did not mean turtles. I would have written turtles if I made that. God damn it. I'm not paying for word. <laughs> Standing by Goku's side, we assist him in repelling the doppelganger, driving Turles away as a familiar face traces after him. I guess that's enough for now. Hurry up! With the immediate threat quelled, our attention is returned to the ongoing Saiyan invasion. Only Gohan and Krillin remain to confront the relentless Nappa and Vegeta. 
Goku rushes to engage Vegeta head on while we are tasked with taking care of Nappa. The enemy AI is definitely less frustrating to face off against. They appear to be less inclined to cheat the system, or at the very least the game is better at hiding it. <laughs> However, Xenoverse 2 seems to be much easier than its predecessor. So much of this is due to the improved controls and combat, which makes the mechanics easier to utilize. But I also believe that the game is significantly less grindy. In Xenoverse 1, there are numerous occasions in the story mode where you would reach a roadblock. If your character was not at a high enough level, you would just do chip damage while your opponents could easily two-shot you. The lack of requiring you to do so much grinding improves the flow of the narrative, so you don't have to constantly stop and go do a bunch of parallel quests to gain levels. You can just do parallel quests for fun, rather than them becoming a chore. The situation escalates when Vegeta creates a fake moon in the sky, with Nappa bolstering the onslaught both transforming into a great ape. The great ape fights return, and they are largely untouched from the first game, so they still aren't very good. You still need to deplete their stamina bar before dealing damage to them. Although there is one difference that I noticed, which is by grabbing them by the tail, does not appear to be as effective against them as it was in the first game. Oh well, I just blast them with key blasts anyway. And if you're wondering whether or not they fixed the timeline inconsistency that was in the first game, the answer is kind of. Instead of the game claiming that Krillin cuts off Vegeta's tail, it remains ambiguous, with Outer Kai just staying to leave it to the little guys, and the cutscene just shows a quick shot of the tail being cut by someone, but not showing who. With the help of Goku, we were able to prevent the Saiyan invasion. In the aftermath of the battle, we intervened to protect Vegeta from Krillin's vengeance, ensuring the preservation of the original course of events. With the timeline secured, we returned to the Time Nest once again to prepare for our next assignment. Back in the Time Nest, we are finally properly introduced to Trunks and the hero from Xenoverse 1. I imagine this scene would be far less impactful for those who never played the first game. I don't remember my character being so short. Why are all my characters too short? Trunks and the Supreme Kai of Time shed light on the shadowy figures believed to be behind the chaos, Toa and Mira. These sinister beings lurk in the shadows. Their motives is to free the seal around the demon realm, for some reason. <laughs> We then get a glimpse of the inner workings of the Time Breakers through a 2D animated cutscene. Xenoverse 2 has a real mixture of styles when it comes to cutscenes. It has these 2D ones, which are okay. They're in the more stiff modern style that I don't particularly like, but I definitely wouldn't say they are bad. The weakest parts about these is when they transition back to gameplay as the characters' designs don't really match up. The 2D characters are in a more leaner style, while the game models are quite buff. Then there are the awesome pre-rendered 3D animated cutscenes, which are definitely my favourite. The animation is so fluid, and I love the art style they went with, and I really wish this was the in-game art style as well. I just don't like the shininess of these models. They keep using them, but I just don't like it. <laughs> Finally, there are the in-game cutscenes that are the most common, and also the most worst. All the characters' movements are just so stiff, and in some cases they look like robots. They also have the tendency to twitch awkwardly. I don't know why, they did. they've done it in the last game, they're still doing it. It's just really unappealing. They still didn't fix the issue with clothes physics either. They did however address the lip movements, as now all of the scenes have characters' mouths actually move when they talk. The lip syncing is way the hell off. It was synced for the Japanese, I don't expect them to redo it for English. The voice acting is great, but it makes the in-game cutscenes look worse because the animations don't match the quality of the performances. There are also some problems with voice direction, like characters calling females he, and mismatches between voice lines and dialogue boxes. But overall, the presentation is a vast improvement over the original. Within the ranks of the Time Breakers, tensions brew as Turles and Slug clash with their superiors. In an attempt to quell their rebellion and strengthen their allegiance, Toa bestows upon them the forbidden fruits of the Tree of Might, tainted by the corruption of the Demon Realm. Mira scrutinizes Toa's methods, questioning her choice not to control Turles and Slug's minds as she had done with Bardock. Yet Toa remains steadfast, believing such tactics is unnecessary. At this point, the game will have you travel around Kanton City to check out the rifts in time before you can continue the main story. Floating above the city are special portals called the Time Miniatures. These portals lead to different time periods outside of Kanton City. There are five of these pedestals, each taking you to a different time with its own quests and challenges. One of these portals leads to Satan House, where the famous Mr. Satan lives. 
or Hercule, if you're a filthy old dub watcher like me. Hercule is looking for a bodyguard and you can earn rewards by helping him out. Another portal leads to Capsule Corporation, owned by Vegeta and his family. Here you can try out Bulma's new invention, the Clothing Mix Robot, to make special items called QQ Bangs. If you're a Saiyan, you can train with Vegeta to become stronger. Guru's house is a peaceful place where Grand Elder Guru lives, but sometimes the house gets attacked and you'll need to help defend it alongside Guru's protector Nail. There's Frieza's ship, which you can't get into until a little bit later on in the game, where you can move up the ranks in Frieza's army. Lastly, there's Margin Boo's house. Boo wants to start a family after reading a book. What kind of book? Well, that's up to you, <laughs> you dirty bastard. <laughs> You'll need to help him gather the food he needs because that is how babies are made. I guess it's kind of true. Give woman food and she gives you baby. <laughs> now these do take a bit of time if you try to complete them all and can get a bit repetitive, but they are completely optional. After traveling through various time rifts, we're able to confront another time distortion. This segment feels a bit like filler. Inserted to maintain coherence regardless of the order in which you play it. However, it suffers from the drawback of seeming redundant, as if it should have been integrated into the Ginyu Force saga or removed altogether. Even the game's summary of this arc is confused as to why it's here. One year after the battle on Namek, Future Trunks warns of the androids made by Dr. Jiro who will attack three years later. What has this got to do with Ruckus on Namek? In the middle of their quest for the elusive Dragon Balls on planet Namek, Gohan and Krillin find themselves ensnared in an encounter with Frieza, Zabon and Dodoria, all shrouded in an eerie aura. Escaping from their clutches, the duo soon realise that this version of Zabon exhibits a level of aggression that diverges from his usual demeanour, a clear sign that history has been tampered with. Harnessing the power of the time scroll, we teleport into the events of Age 762, intercepting the relentless pursuit and lending our aid to Krillin in a desperate struggle against Zabon and Dodoria. In fights, you can use the targeting system to lock onto an opponents to focus in on them. This is actually one of the mechanics that I had the most issues with, because sometimes when I was locked on, my character would just lose the lock on and I'd end up whiffing attacks. This was most notable when using Key Blast Supers. I really do not understand why this was happening. Maybe the lock on is a soft lock on rather than a hard lock on, but then why would the game have a lock on button if it was just going to ignore it? Aside from that, the lock on in the character is pretty decent. It follows the action well and it quickly snaps to other targets when needed. While Gaha manages to flee to locate Dende, with Dodoria following after, we engage Zabon in combat, buying Krillin more time to find an escape route. Eventually Krillin manages to slip away, leaving us to chase after Dodoria. Fortunately, Vegeta intervenes, thwarting Dodoria's pursuit of Gohan, restoring the timeline to its original state. However, before we can return to the sanctity of the Time Nest, Lord Slug appears before us. Lord Slug is the main villain in the Dragon Ball Z Lord Slug film. I know, shocking. Slug is a super Namekian and was sent to planet Slug as a baby to escape the extinction of planet Namek. Over time, he became overcome by evil. <laughs> That's such a bad sentence. <laughs> Transforming into a conqueror of planets, Slug formed an army of demon-like soldiers and used them to seize conquered planets, sometimes turning them into giant spaceships. He set his sights on Earth, killing those who opposed him and seeking the Dragon Balls for eternal youth, but he was ultimately defeated by Goku using the Spirit Bomb. Later, Slug and Turles were recruited by Toa and Mira to aid in reviving the demon realm, meddling in events from the different timelines. This whole saga feels like it was here just to better introduce Lord Slug. As the battle intensifies, the arrival of Time Patrol's future trunks shifts the tide, forcing Lord Slug into retreat. With the immediate threat quelled, our attention shifts to the aiding Vegeta in a showdown against the empowered Dodoria. Super attacks, also known as super skills, play a pivotal role in combat and are classified into four primary categories. Strike skills or strike supers, key blasts, also known as key supers or key blast supers, power ups, which are just buffs, and then the other stuff. <laughs> I don't know what they're called. <laughs> Your character has the ability to equip up to four super attacks in designated slots. These moves can really change the course of a battle, but they consume keys, so you have to be smart about managing your energy. Key blast skills mostly consist of long range energy blasts, while strike skills typically involve close range physical attacks that are much easier to incorporate into combos. The other category comprises utility skills like energy charges, stamina restoration techniques, and non-damaging movement and defensive abilities. At the conclusion of the battle, Vegeta unleashes a devastating key blast, obliterating Dodoria and solidifying our victory. 
back at the time nest the Kai's explained to us to Tullus and Slugger but I already done that so I won't be explaining that again. She cuts the conversation short however since she needs to prepare for Toki Toki to lay an egg as the bird of time his eggs are able to create entirely new timelines and yes the male bird is in fact laying an egg and no the game does not explain this so how the bloody hell am I supposed to? <laughs> The aftermath of Zabon and Dodoria's defeat at the hands of Vegeta left a lingering tension on planet Namek. Gohan and Krillin's pursuit of the Dragon Balls pushed them into dangerous territory as Frieza, growing increasingly frustrated with these interlopers, called forth his elite enforcers, the notorious Ginyu Force. With the fate of Namek hanging in the balance, Gohan and Krillin reluctantly ally themselves with Vegeta in a desperate bid to confront the formidable Ginyu Force. However, their combined might prove futile against the overwhelming powers of the specialized unit. In a twist of fate within the altered timeline, the insidious Captain Ginyu managed to steal Vegeta's body, plunging the situation into further chaos. Outer Kai, quick to cast suspicion upon Vegeta, was soon enlightened by future Trunks, who clarified that Captain Ginyu was the true perpetrator. Recognizing the need to rectify the time distortion, we embark on a mission to Planet Namek once more. Upon our return, we find ourselves thrust into the fray alongside Gohan, Krillin and Vegeta, engaging in a battle against the Ginyu Force, with Ginyu, Rakum and Gildo radiating an ominous aura. It's pretty cool to have the hero from Xenoverse 1 back in Xenoverse 2, especially for players who enjoyed the first game. But it got me thinking where exactly does Xenoverse 2 fit into the Dragon Ball timeline? I'm not talking about the two year gap mentioned at the beginning of the game, but rather which points in the various saga timelines the characters are travelling to. In Xenoverse 1, the hero restored history to its normal state. However, in Xenoverse 2, we find ourselves revisiting some of the same moments in time, except they're not fixed. So this raises the question, are we time travelling to the events before the Xenoverse 1 hero arrived, or are these completely different timelines altogether? Furthermore, if we're dealing with parallel dimensions, then what's the point of trying to fix the timeline's history? Wouldn't it just create a new timeline anyway, since we're no longer working within the closed timeline loops? I think this is where the parallel quests come from, but then it would be never ending creation of timelines and there would be infinite timelines and in one of those timelines there is bound to be at least one that Toa and Mira succeed in their mission. It's just confusing having these two games existing in the same universe as each other because the time travel doesn't really facilitate it. <laughs> just when victory seems within grasp, Goku, freshly trained under extreme gravity, makes a dramatic entrance taking all of the credit. However, the triumph is short-lived as Turles intervenes, granting additional power upon Jace and Berta with the nefarious fruits of the Tree of Might. The battle escalates with renewed ferocity, with Jace and Berta becoming even more formidable. Despite their valiant efforts, the strength bestowed upon the Ginyu Force proved insufficient to bridge the power gap. Suddenly, Captain Ginyu reappears, but now inhabiting the body of Trunks. <laughs> Yo, Captain Ginyu of the Ginyu Force has arrived! With the wounded trunks trapped within Ginyu's former vessel. In the ensuing battle, Ginyu, driven to desperation, attempts to seize Goku's body once more with the help of Turles. In a twist of irony, Turles by holding Goku in place and aiding Ginyu, he inadvertently restores the proper flow of history. I really wish Xenoverse 2 didn't revisit so many of the same events as in Xenoverse 1. I get they are wanting to cover the most iconic moments of Dragon Ball Z, but they had already done that and it also makes the time travel aspect make even less sense than it already does. All they have really done to change it up is add in some movie villains, which is enjoyable, but it just isn't quite enough to stop me feeling some serious deja vu while playing through the campaign. And in the case of the Ginyu Force segment, it feels like a bit of a downgrade, because this saga was definitely a highlight of Xenoverse 1, but here it is just tired. Following further skirmishes, Turles was eventually repelled, leaving a desperate Ginyu to resort to attempting to seize control over our body. But Goku successfully reclaims his rightful body by trapping Ginyu within a Namekian frog, realigning time into the right alignment. That was a really badly written sentence. There you go. <laughs> I'm leaving it in. Now back at the Time Nest, the Supreme Kai expresses a somber realization of the formidable alliance between Turles, Slug, Toa and Mira. 
With Tell's scientific prowess and Mirror's brawn, the Time Patrol faces an uphill battle. Elder Kai emphasizes the importance of vigilance, urging Trunks to tread cautiously. With Trunks and the Xenoverse 1 hero embarking on a mission to track down Mirror, the responsibility fell upon us to keep watch over history. With Trunks still out hunting for Mira, we have to tackle this next time distortion on our own. Not that Trunks is that much help anyway. Before we head out, Elder Kai expresses genuine concern for our safety, urging caution before our departure. The Supreme Kai of Time playfully jests about Elder Kai's worry. Now I'm not that big of a fan as the Elder Kai as a character, but I actually think he works really well within the story as he does give the Supreme Kai of Time someone else to bounce off of. In the first game the dialogue became a bit dull in many moments since Trunks is kind of her subordinate in a way so he didn't really retort back much and then the player character is a silent protagonist so most of the time they were just nodding or standing in silence. It didn't really set the stage for very compelling conversations. In the age 762, Dende hurries to convey the password for the Namekian Dragon Balls to Gohan, while Nail confronts Frieza. However, Frieza's dark aura amplifies his power, necessitating our intervention to protect Nail and prevent history from changing. During battles, characters will often engage in banter, providing additional context to the unfolding story, without the need for extensive cutscenes. While this feature enriches the storytelling, it also presents a challenge. Defeating opponents too quickly risks missing crucial dialogue. To address this issue, the game occasionally renders enemies invulnerable once they reach a certain health threshold, allowing important story moments to unfold. However, this solution proves frustrating in practice as you'll find yourself unable to inflict damage, so you end up just playing keep away from your opponent, prolonging the confrontation until the narrative progresses. Also, the inconsistency of this mechanic further exasperates the issue, with characters occasionally being abruptly cut off mid-sentence, so it's not even consistent with it. Partway through the fight, the Supreme Kai of Time unveils that Trellis and Slug lurk somewhere nearby the coveted Dragon Balls, likely scheming to steal them for their own use. We won't be able to make it in time to stop them, necessitating a retreat to the Time Nest after repelling Frieza's onslaught. Yet a glimpse of hope emerges as the Supreme Kai of Time leverages our ability to manipulate time, orchestrating a plan to intercept Trellis and Slug at an earlier junction in the timeline. Now you'd think that having this ability would be a game changer, but it isn't. After this, everyone goes back to being idiots and don't even attempt to take advantage of being able to time travel at will. The Xenoverse series has a bad habit of lampshading issues and inconsistencies, but doing nothing to justify them or rectify them. So why bring it up at all? It just makes the story more confusing, especially for those who are actually trying to pay attention. Anyway, back in Age 762, but a slightly earlier version, we find ourselves thrust into a dire situation. Tarlis launches a relentless assault on Krillin and Gohan, wielding the Namekian Dragon Balls as the linchpin of his sinister ambitions. With plans to wish for eternal life and bolster his strength by consuming the fruit from the Tree of Might, Tarlis remains fixated on his insatiable thirst for power, despite his purported alliance to Toa and Mira. I was going to go on a rant about how he should just time travel to a point where the Z fighters weren't, or something like that, but I think that I've already made my point that this game does not use time travel very well. And also I don't really know whether or not Tarlis has control over where he ends up. Like is it just Toa that is dropping him in certain timelines? It, it doesn't really explain it. Just as Tarlis is about to make his wish using the Dragon Balls, Slug arrives insisting that the balls are rightfully his. He boldly proclaims his ambition to rule the universe, leaving no room for Tarlis. Suddenly we appear in the middle of the heated dispute. Irritated by our interference, Tarlis and Slug reluctantly agree to a temporary truce. After consuming the fruit from the Tree of Might, they are eloped in a sinister aura, bolstering their power as they launch a fierce assault against us. In the midst of battle, they undergo further power-ups while Toa and Mera watch closely, intrigued by the unfolding events. Toa is experimenting with a new spell that works by shaving off the life of its user to unleash a new level of power. Trunks comes to our aid in battling Slug and Turles, while the hero from Xenoverse 1 pursues Mira. The battle intensifies with both sides unleashing powerful attacks. Despite the dark magic of Toa's spell aiding them, with Trunks by our side, we succeed in defeating Slug and Turles with our mighty Key Blast. Nice car. As the dust settles, Trunks resumes his pursuit of Mira, while we set out to locate Gohan and the rest of our allies. 
Frieza has completed his transformation into his final form, gaining unprecedented power due to the altered timeline. It falls upon us to shield Gohan, Krillin and Piccolo from his onslaught until Goku can join the fray. However, this is another fight that you can't really do much in because the game won't let you deplete Frieza's health down too low. After recovering from his injuries sustained in the clash with Ginyu, Goku lends his strength to our struggle against Frieza. The battle rages fiercely as we buy time for Goku to gather energy for the spirit bomb. Eventually, Goku unleashes the spirit bomb, emerging victorious. But then, Frieza consumed by rage, ruthlessly takes Krillin's life before turning his wrath towards Goku. Enraged by the loss of his best friend, Goku undergoes a monumental transformation into a Super Saiyan, signalling the beginning of his ultimate showdown with Frieza. At this point, I found myself growing frustrated with the repetitive nature of the story and battles feeling like I was just playing the first game again. But it was almost as if the game read my mind or something, because right at this point, Frieza's older brother shows up to join the fight. This is why I said before that I think the game is subverting the player's expectations, but I'm not sure if it's doing it on purpose. Unlocking transformations in Xenoverse 2 requires a bit more effort compared to the previous game, plus the game doesn't really explain how to get them. You need to do quests in the rifts in time found in the hub world to unlock transformations, but it's not the same for every race. For Saiyans you go to Vegeta, for humans it's Hercule and so on. Also you need to be a high level, I think it's around level 40 or so, maybe higher. I think I got mine around 43. Three or something. Transformations are more balanced in Xenoverse 2 than before. Super Saiyan, for example, has been toned down to prevent it from dominating battles. In the previous game, the unlimited ultimates granted by Super Saiyan made it way too overpowered. Although Cooler's arrival evens the odds, Goku ultimately emerges victorious. Our attention shifts to Trunks and the Xenoverse 1 hero locked in a fierce battle against Mira. Upon our arrival, he decides to retreat, prompting the Xenoverse 1 hero to pursue him. Meanwhile, the rest of us return to the Time Nest. In the distance, Bardock has been watching the scene silently, before disappearing as well. After the Freezer Saga, we have been promoted to an expert time patroller and now have a flying license. This license allows us to fly around in the hub world, which is awesome because not being able to fly around in the hub world in the first game really annoyed me. Plus, Canton City is definitely designed with flying in mind and it is a lot easier to reach certain destinations with flight. This way, you are not so reliant on the fast travel system run by the robots. The mechanics work the same as they did in the first game, and I know I keep saying that a lot. But Xenoverse 2 in terms of controls is just a more refined version of Xenoverse 1's controls. I still don't really like that by default you use L3 for descending because it still feels really awkward to me, but honestly I couldn't figure out a better button to put the action on without completely mucking up the rest of the controls. It's the controller's fault. To be controller you need more buttons. Call the keyboard, that's what it is. Exploring Contown City while being able to fly is way more fun. There are even characters flying around in the sky that you can interact with and some will even challenge you to a fight. <laughs> Since we have some free time before heading to our next mission, let's explore Canton City a little more as there are lots of places to see and visit. Our first stop is the replica of Orange Star High School, which serves as the Patrol Academy with Elder Kai as its head. The school offers challenge quests and advanced tutorials. Another system that the game has that will give you access to more skills and training is the Masters. Just like in the first game, you can train under a Master. There are heaps of them that you can find hanging around Canton City, and they are all iconic characters from the series, and each has their own unique set of techniques to teach. By becoming a student under a master, you can learn new moves, skills and abilities. As you progress through their training, the bond with your master will deepen and your training rank will rise. Another perk to training under a master is that they will sometimes come to aid you in battle, especially if it's not going so well. You can also customise your master's skill loadout as well as their outfit using TP. TP is sometimes rewarded by completing missions, or you can buy them with real money. Yay, microtransaction is my favourite. But the best part about the academy is playing paper scissors rock with Piccolo. Canton City is quite large, so the game provides you with a map that you can bring up when wandering the city. It has clear icons with a legend in the corner, making it easy to locate where everything is. And the bamboo forest is where I keep my pet fish. He's sleeping. 
While walking around Canton City, there are NPCs that you can talk to. They'll even approach you at times. They don't really have anything that interesting to say, but they will give you items and sometimes they'll ask you to go on missions. Salutations! I am in dire need of travelers who might be interested in a quest. No. Over here is probably the most important district as it is where they grow all of the cabbages. Up in the resort district is where I like to practice dancing. And let's end the tour at the shopping district, where I spend all of my money on shit I don't need. Like clothes. Xenoverse 2 has a ton of clothing that you can collect and equip to your character. There is representation from all over the Dragon Ball series. There are four separate slots that you can equip with separate pieces of clothing, all with their own separate stat modifiers. Now when I play the game, I don't really care about the stats they give, I just like to dress up. But there is a system in the game that allows players to do both, and that's through QQ Bangs. In Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2, QQ Bangs are special items that players can create to customize their character's stats without altering their appearance. These QQ Bangs are created by mixing together various clothing items in the game. When equipped, QQ Bangs override the stats provided by the actual clothing you have equipped allowing you to optimize your stats for your playstyle without being limited by the stats of your equipped clothing. The system is awesome as it provides greater flexibility in customizing your character's attributes without worrying whether or not your hat matches your shoes. It also gives you use out of duplicate clothing, aside from just selling it. I have no idea where the name QQ Bang comes from. It's such a random name that doesn't really indicate at all what they do. They should have just named them Glamours or something, because that's what they essentially are. Okay, that's it for the tour. Returning to talk to Outer Kai, we have the choice of starting the Android Saga or going to find Trunks, who has wandered off on his own somewhere. We head off in search of Trunks and quickly find him within the time nest, looking at a scroll from the age 780. Gohan? You're still alive? We'll fix that soon enough. Kill him. Full power. Can't be. Go on. Go on. Go on. Approaching Trunks in the Time Vault, we found him engrossed in a profound contemplation. As we draw near, he turns to us and reveals the scroll is the history where he originates from. In Trunks' timeline, the androids brought devastation upon the world. Gohan and the Z Fighters, brave as they were, fell one by one to their relentless onslaught. Were it not for his mother's ingenuity in crafting the time machine, all would have perished. But before Trunks could elaborate further, Elder Kai interjects, who states he doesn't approve of a machine that can fiddle around with history, which Trunks agrees with. Suddenly the scroll becomes corrupted, showing a change occurring in age 780. Very alarmed, Trunks insists that they take action quickly. The Supreme Kai of Time appears and asks Trunks if he understands what is required of him. Her words, a gentle reminder of a weight he bears as a time patroller. Trunks nodded solemnly, his determination unwavering. He entrusts the task to us, passing the scroll into our hands, as it is too perilous for him to venture into his own history. And so we journey into the annals of age 780. After knocking out future Trunks to prevent him from being killed by the androids, future Gohan is on his way to confront androids 17 and 18. On the way he spots a different android, one that he has never seen before. It is Android 16, engulfed with a dark aura. With our timely intervention, we join the fray. Trunks notes that 16 shouldn't be in his timeline, but states that it doesn't matter how he came to be in this timeline, as they need to protect Gohan. I'm guessing that 16 is actually from this timeline, but was activated by Toa, I think. In the aftermath of our intense battle, Android 16 lies defeated at our feet. But before we can catch our breath, a new threat emerges, Mirror. 
With a sinister grin, he confirms our suspicions, revealing that the Timebreakers orchestrated Android 16's attack on Gohan. Mira's motives transcend mere manipulation. He craves Gohan's hidden power. He sees it as the key to his own evolution, a means to surpass his mortal limitations and ascend to greater heights. With a hunger broadening on obsession, he seeks to absorb Gohan's potential, driven by the desire for ultimate power. I don't really understand the point of the Timebreakers sending 16 to attack Gohan because he was going to be facing off against 17 and 18 and they would have weakened him anyway, giving Mira the opening to steal his power. But adding this extra step has given the Time Patrol more of a chance to stop him. Is it so that Trunks wouldn't find Gohan's body and trigger his Super Saiyan transformation? But wouldn't it be way easier just to move Gohan's body after he's already dead? I feel like the villains are overthinking their plans a little bit too much. And so am I. <laughs> Due to our fight with Android 16, neither of us have enough strength left to face Mira. Sensing our plight, Trunks disregards the protests of both the Supreme Kai of Time and Outer Kai, seizing the time scroll to aid us in our hour of need. Trunks unleashes a powerful key blast at Mira, diverting his attention from our vulnerable position. Mira is actually pleased to see Trunks, knowing the damage his presence in this timeline could cause. A flicker of recognition crosses Fritcher Gohan's features as he gazes upon Trunks, now older and transformed into a Super Saiyan. The Supreme Kai of Time rebukes Trunks for his impulsive actions, but he offers a heartfelt apology, stating he can't just abandon Gohan. Eventually the three manage to overpower Mira, who insists he must be stronger but can't understand why he is unable to defeat them. Trunks states he will not let Mira kill Gohan before Mira bids a hasty retreat. After the battle, future Gohan realized that Trunks is from the future and assumes Bulma had managed to finish her time machine and states he is really proud of Trunks. Emotions run high as Trunks expresses gratitude towards his mentor, but Gohan reminds him of the pressing threat posed by androids 17 and 18. Torn between duty and emotion, Trunks offers to aid Gohan in the fight, determined not to let history repeat itself. Yet the Supreme Kai of Time issues a solemn warning, reminding Trunks of the ramifications of altering the course of history. As uncertainty hangs heavy in the air, she implores us to intervene. Now this is the type of internal conflict that the series was missing. I really loved that they actually addressed the desire that Trunks must have to alter time to save his mentor. I mean he went to all that trouble in the main series to save everyone. It is very much in his nature to want to do so again. This saga is definitely the highlight of the game. I just wish that it was longer. It would have been fascinating to explore Trunks' internal struggles and growth even further, delving into the consequences of his actions and the moral dilemmas he faces. Overall, this saga showcases the potential for a more nuanced and introspective narrative within the Xenoverse series. It's just a shame that they chose to focus on quantity over quality, at least when it comes to the story. Future Gohan realizes his fate from Trunks' reaction and realizes that Trunks will succeed where he himself failed. Finding solace in the knowledge that his struggle serves a greater purpose, Future Gohan chooses to depart alone, expressing gratitude for the friendship he found in Trunks before bidding him farewell. Despite Trunks' attempts to dissuade Gohan, the warrior stands firm, assuring Trunks that he has already resolved to go his own way. Reluctantly accepting this, we make our way back to the Time Nest. Upon our return to the Time Nest, Outer Kai and the Supreme Kai of Time commend us for a job well done. Recognizing the strain Trunks endured during the encounter with future Gohan, Outer Kai advises him to take a much needed break, assuring that he'll monitor the scrolls for any further disturbances. Shortly after, we revisit the Time Vault only to uncover another anomaly in Age 780. Toa's scientific prowess has resurrected Android 16, who has pursued future Trunks through time. Meanwhile in Age 785, a future Trunks fresh from the Cell Games from the primary timeline endeavours to restore peace to his era. Just to clarify, this Trunks is not this Trunks. Except actually it is if you played the first game. It didn't make sense in that game, and it makes even less sense in this game. And this is compounded even more by the fact that they reuse the cutscenes from the first game and it makes out that the Xenoverse 1 hero was never here because we are here instead. But if we were here instead and saved Trunks then why was he ever at risk of disappearing in the first game? That makes sense. Don't think about it. Okay. Anyway, we face off against a rebuilt Android 16 and in an empowered perfect cell. 
likely influenced by Toa's dark magic. The unexpected alliance between Cell and Android 16 poses a formidable challenge. However, through determined efforts, we vanquish both adversaries, resulting in the demise of future 17 and 18, thus bringing peace to Trunks' timeline. Grateful for our assistance, Future Trunks attempts to express his thanks, only for us to vanish and return to the Time Nest. Trunks, now having recuperated from the emotional strain of the encounter with Gohan, reunites with the others and offers his apologies for his impulsive behaviour. The Supreme Guy of Time admonishes him to refrain from such rash actions in the future, emphasising the inherent dangers involved. Trunks solemnly acknowledges her advice and agrees to exercise caution. Later we observe Trunks revisiting the time scroll, once again witnessing the final moments of future Gohan, which unfold almost exactly as before, almost. Gohan, you're still alive? We'll fix that soon enough. Kill him, full power. I will never die, even if my body breaks. Another will rise in my place to dismantle you heartless androids. The Supreme Kai of Time acknowledges the alteration in the timeline, but opts to leave it unchanged when she merges the scrolls. Elder Kai, in a sarcastic tone, questions the significance of the shift, suggesting they simply overlook it. However, after deliberation, they decide to honour Trunks and future Gohan by allowing the events to stand, recognising Gohan's courageous sacrifice and trusting that Trunks will eventually bring peace by defeating the androids. It seems that this revisited timeline aligns with the events depicted in the OVA History of Trunks. Notably, Gohan's line about another warrior taking his place is absent from the original timeline, implying that future Gohan faced his fate with bravery, knowing that Trunks would eventually bring peace to the world after encountering Trunks due to the Timebreaker's interference. I think that's right. That's actually a really cool implementation of the time travel into the storytelling. I knew they had it in them. I knew they could do it. Once again, history takes a dark turn. Amidst a sinister aura, Sal effortlessly overwhelms Piccolo and the other Z fighters, further exasperating the situation by absorbing Android 17 and 18 simultaneously. This premature transformation grants him his perfect form much earlier than in the original timeline. Even though this pretty much spells the end of the world, Trunks seems more concerned with the fact that now Krillin and 18 won't be able to get married. They can still get married, Trunks. It would just be Sal standing at the altar rather than 18. <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> now that's an interesting what if scenario. Given Trunks' familiarity with the juncture in history, he offers his assistance, finally, because honestly, he hasn't been all that helpful during the game so far. Travelling back to the age of 767, precisely as the battle between 17 and Piccolo commences, we witness 17 also falling under Toa's dark influence. Our task becomes clear, intervene in the conflict to ensure Piccolo's survival. In fights that require you to defend other characters, you will often lose the fight if their health reaches zero, which can be quite annoying at times as the AI has no self-preservation instincts. When you are partnered with other players and AIs in certain mission types and they fall in battle, you are able to revive them. All you have to do is get within the healing zone and stay there until they get back up. They won't be revived with much health, but you can use items to help heal them back up. Eventually, Sal makes his appearance, and while we're eager to confront him, we must exercise caution not to inflict too much damage, ensuring that he still absorbs Android 17. Android 16 unexpectedly joins the fray, which feels somewhat awkward given our recent attempts to eliminate him. Despite Android 17's proud defiance, his misplaced confidence proves fatal as Sal seizes the opportunity to absorb him. With our task accomplished, we depart from the scene. Back with the two Kais, concern mounts as we have yet to encounter Toa and Mira. Right on cue, we're summoned back to the age 767, where an unexpected participant threatens to disrupt Goku's showdown against Cell. Mira, a formidable bio-android from the future, engineered by the brilliant scientist Toa, has arrived to wreak havoc. With Trunks providing support, we engage in a fierce battle against Mira. Mira's insatiable thirst for power knows no bounds. Fueled by his relentless pursuit of strengths, born from Toll's experiments, he embodies a fusion of Earthling, Demon and Saiyan traits. Despite our efforts, Mira proves to be a formidable adversary. 
Suddenly, Toa materializes, announcing that our plans are set in motion. With a playful taunt, she and Mira vanish, leaving us to sense an ominous surge in Sal's power, most likely orchestrated by Toa. We will have to continue to the Sal games alone, as Trunks' oldest self is also there. The next segment is pretty much another copy-paste job from the first game. We have to help the Z fighters fight a bunch of the Sal juniors. Gohan watches his friends get beat to shit and triggers his transformation into Super Saiyan 2. And then we just fight some more and this whole time I'm just like, really? We have to do this again? But actually no, it is a fake out. As a giant wormhole appears in the sky, through it, a huge horde of metal callers step through, interrupting the Cell games. This genuinely caught me off guard, but in a good way. Meta callers are from the film Dragon Ball Z Return of Caller. They are cyborg clones of the caller we face back on Namek, produced by the Big Getty Star and controlled from its core. Partway through the fight, we actually end up traveling through the wormhole to New Namek, where the Big Getty Star is located. Well, in theory. It's not actually in the game, but it is in my imagination. Fights with you up against a group of enemies on your own were by far the most frustrating battles in Xenoverse 1. <sighs> of having horrible flashbacks of them. <laughs> Fuck. The enemies would just relentlessly barrage you with key blasts while others were charging at you, punching and kicking. They were such a clusterfuck. You could barely get any opening half the time before they would completely decimate your health. The best strategy was to spam ultimate attacks because of the invincibility frames they would give you. Thank god this has been rectified in Xenoverse 2. The game still does have you facing off against a bunch of enemies at once, but they don't all come at you at once. Admittedly this does look a bit weird as the other AI will just be politely waiting to bash your head in, but trust me this is a far better alternative. If this metal cooler fight would have been in the first game, I would have been like, fuck this game, I quit. <laughs> but it's not, and it's actually fun and well paced. Following our triumph over all of the callers, we swiftly return to Earth to aid Gohan in his ongoing battle against Cell, whose powers continue to be amplified by the ominous dark aura. Also, they wanted the Cell saga to end with a fight against Cell. I can respect sticking to a theme. I got my ass handed to me during this fight though. I think I made my character too much of a glass cannon, and she has almost no health. Luckily, you can utilize items with various effects to aid you during battle. Items can be obtained from Canton C shops, created through mixing, received as mission rewards, or even given by NPCs roaming the streets. They can also be found scattered throughout missions and the streets of Canton City, incentivizing players to explore for additional resources. These items can be assigned to an item palette before starting a mission. This mechanic remains unchanged from the first game, leading to the same issue I had where I would forget to dismiss the item menu after using one, leaving me vulnerable to attacks as you cannot perform other actions while the menu is open. It's important to note that this is a user error, not a flaw in the game design. I'm an idiot. With a bit of item spamming, we were able to help Gohan, and he finishes Cell off with the iconic father and son Kamehameha. The Supreme Kai of Time summons us to the Time Vault with some exciting news. Toki Toki has finally laid the long-awaited egg. However, Trunks appears less enthused, prompting Naoto Kai to elaborate that this event signifies the dawn of an entirely new timeline. Eager to commemorate the occasion, the Supreme Kai of Time proposes a celebration party, complete with their own culinary delights. Yet the enthusiasm isn't shared by everyone, leading her to decide to postpone the festivities until everyone is present, including the still absent Xenoverse 1 hero. Before further discussion can take place, a disturbance in history begins to manifest. In an unknown timeline, Bardock hands over Babidi's energy suction thing to Toa, who then uses it to transfer its power over to Mira. The energy had been gathered by Tola, Slug and Cooler, a lot of it probably from fighting us. We fell for it. Despite initially feeling stronger, Mira is gripped by an anxiety as he realizes he is outmatched by the overwhelming power of Broly and Janibus standing behind him. Moreover, he frets over Bardock's newfound strength since they initially captured him. Before Mira can dwell further, Toa declares that the time has come to set their plan in motion. I'm going to be honest, initially during this cutscene, I thought they had forgot to animate Mira's mouth movements because I didn't realize he was thinking. Why do they possess it? But I do not. His voice doesn't have the thinking filter. Dragon Ball has always had a thinking filter. How am I supposed to think without it? In the age 774, Vegeta falls under Babidi's malevolent influence, 
Despite the expected clash between Vegeta and Goku, the legendary Super Saiyan Broly emerges unexpectedly. To restore proper course of history and shield Goku, we must intervene. This is the super villain version of Broly, which was spoiled for me at the beginning of the game because for whatever reason he was unlocked on my character roster at the very start of my playthrough. Usually story characters will only become playable until after you've played through their section of the story. I'm not sure if this is a glitch or I just have them through some DLC that I wasn't aware of. This is one of the biggest hurdles when playing Xenoverse 2 so late in the game's life because it is hard to even tell what was part of the original release and what has been patched in later on. And don't get me started on the amount of DLC there is for this game. Just thinking about the store page gives me decision paralysis. Engaged in a fierce battle with Broly, we struggle to subdue him before Majin Buu's arrival compounds the peril. Even worse, Majin Buu exhibits signs of corruption by Toa. With Goku incapacitated, the burden falls upon us and Vegeta to confront these formidable foes. Though we manage to repel Broly temporarily, Majin Buu remains relentless. In a selfless act to protect his loved ones, Hug complete. <laughs> Vegeta makes the ultimate sacrifice fully aware of the consequences awaiting him in hell. At the time nest, the Kais admit that this must have been a hard piece of history for Trunks to revisit. Trunks says that he is fine, and also he is very proud to be his father's son. As Super Booster comes to corruption, we prepare to rectify the timeline once more. While we confront Super Boo, Trunks sets out to track down Mira. Meanwhile, Kid Trunks and Goten have just completed their fusion training with Piccolo. When Super Boo breaches the lookout, just in the nick of time, we join the fray to assist in the battle. However, the fusion eventually dissipates, leaving us to endure until Gohan's arrival, promised by Elder Kai, who assures us that Gohan is en route and fully empowered thanks to his rigorous training. After, we somehow get teleported to the desert mountain area, where Gohan emerges to lend us his aid in the fight. The story mode has a tendency to teleport you around with no explanation. <laughs> Most of the time it isn't really that noticeable, because if you are familiar with the source material, your brain can kind of fill in the blanks. But sometimes it can be quite jarring, as if there are missing cutscenes or something. Broly shows up again, and this time he is much stronger, thanks to his same blood. He has this really annoying ultimate attack that can be really easy to run into if you are not paying close enough attention as to where he throws it. Ultimate attacks are basically just souped up super attacks. You can assign them to your character just like any other skill, but they do have higher resource requirements than most other attacks. In Xenoverse 1, they are pretty much impossible to interrupt because you are invincible the whole time while performing them. But in this game, there is a larger time frame between initiating your ultimate and gaining the iframes, so there is a bigger risk to using them. Our focus shifts to ensuring our attacks are directed solely at Broly to minimise interference with history. Just as Broly teethers on the brink of defeat, a crucial revelation emerges. Trunks finds himself in hell, endeavouring to aid his father's escape. If Vegeta remains trapped, the Patara fusion will be rendered useless and the timeline will remain in disarray. We deliver the decisive blow to Broly before swiftly teleporting to hell. Upon our arrival, we discover Trunks lying defeated on the ground, with the menacing presence of the supervillain Janimba looming nearby. What I really appreciate is how Xenoverse 2 has weaved the Dragon Ball films into the narrative in a way that makes sense for both the films and the game, especially here with Vegeta and Hal facing Janimba, because this does in a way act as an alternate history of the Dragon Ball Z Fusion Reborn film, as well as making sense within Xenoverse 2's plot. Vegeta deals the final blow to Janimba, securing his escape from Hal. <laughs> Before embarking on the final leg of the saga, we return to the time nest to check on Trunks. Although his wounds are healed, he remains unconscious, which means that we'll need to venture back into the timeline solo once again. As Sir Item used to being alone, Goku and Vegeta find themselves locked in a fierce confrontation with the true form of Majin Buu, whose power has surged once more under the influence of the Dark Aura. With Buu's strength proving overwhelming, we must stand alongside Vegeta, fighting beside him until Goku can harness the spirit bomb. Of course, the final fight of the saga has to be against my arch nemesis, Kid Buu. He always kicks my ass in every game I play, and you'll never guess what happened. I won. 
first try. Except I didn't. I died. And then the game's advice to help me win was to grab a giant ape by its tail. What? With the assistance of Vegeta and Hercule, we managed to withstand Kid Buu's onslaught long enough for Goku to unleash the super spirit bomb. Obliberate. Obliberate. <laughs> Oblib <laughs> obliterating Kid Buu. As our heroes take a well-deserved respite, we quietly slip away unnoticed. However, just as we're about to depart, Trunks interjects through the communication channel from the Time Nest. Having regained consciousness in our absence, he reveals a troubling discovery. Someone besides Janimba is aiding Mira in Hell. Suspecting the nefarious intentions to gather energy from our battle, Trunks warns us that they must be nearby. Spotting the masked man attempting to flee, we hastily give chase. Let me smell your breath! Let me smell your breath! We, along with Bardock, uh, I mean the mysterious Mars Saiyan, are transported to age 778, right in the middle of the fight between Goku and Beerus, and I mean quite literally in the middle of them. Beerus is a bit pissed, but we just ignore him for the time being and fight Bardock. I mean, the mysterious Mars Saiyan. I really appreciate how seamlessly the saga flows from the previous one. Canton City, while a fantastic hub, does sometimes distract the narrative flow, as the game encourages frequent returns for gear adjustments and attribute points allocation. Despite the immediate continuation of the story, I found myself needing to return to Canton City briefly to manage my attribute points, because I keep forgetting to do so in between missions. Oops. Xenophers 2 still grapples with the issue of the character level reliance, but it's less pronounced in the story mode thanks to the smoother difficulty curve. This ensures a more enjoyable and balanced gameplay experience without sudden spikes in difficulty. Leveling mechanics remain consistent with the first game, earning XP from missions to level up and allocating attribute points to enhance specific stats. However, there is a level cap and a limit to the number of points earned, discouraging a jack of all trades approach. For this character, I went with a key build, which is basically the opposite of my main build in Xenoverse 1. With the key build, my character's energy attacks were much stronger and I was able to unleash devastating super moves. The downside was that it left my character vulnerable in close combat situations and she did end up being a bit of a glass cannon. During the fierce fight, a piece of our opponent's mask gets broken off and it turns out that it's Bardock. I am shocked! Shocked! Well, not that shocked. I am fairly certain that this is not supposed to be a reveal for the player, only for the characters, because the game doesn't even try to make this ambiguous. As the confrontation continues, Mira enters the fray, seemingly more interested in testing our strength than saving Bardock. I love this stage. Earth looks so beautiful in the background. Xenoverse 2 boasts visually stunning stages, striking a balance between spaciousness for gameplay and avoiding feeling barren. The only real issue I had with them was sometimes I didn't realise that I was at the edge of a stage and I'd go to dodge an attack and end up hitting the barrier instead. Throughout our battle with Mira and Bardock, Beerus observes with growing impatience. Eventually his tolerance wanes and he resolves to destroy everything in sight. Lord Beerus is what you'd get if you'd fuse a two year old with a cat. To placate Burris's anger, the Supreme Kai of Time offers him an entire crate of her homemade pudding in exchange for not destroying everything. Burris begrudgingly agrees and extends the offer of pudding to everyone present. Despite Burris's acceptance, Mira and Braddock decline the offer and bugger off. If you've been attentive throughout the game, you'll anticipate what happens next. Various characters have commented on the Supreme Kai of Time's culinary skills, setting the stage for this moment. A prime example of effective storytelling, with setup and payoff. However, Beerus's anger only intensifies when he tastes the pudding, prompting Whis to enlist our help in subduing him. And then the camera zooms in on my character's boobs. Whoa, whoa, whoa. As the intense battle against the God of Destruction unfolds, the Supreme Kai of Time attempts to apologise for a dreadful pudding. Hey, at least she tries. I remember one time, I made muffins and I misread the instructions and I put in way too much cocoa powder. They they are so foul. <laughs> My goodness. Beerus finally calms down and Earth is saved once again. As long as we don't give him any more of the Supreme Kai of Time's pudding. Are you trying to kill me? 
Trunks detects an unusual shift in a previously ineffective scroll, indicating the time breakers are intensifying their efforts to gather energy. The Supreme Kai of Time warns that with a bit more energy they could breach the barrier separating the demon realm from our own, unleashing evil across the realms. Determined to prevent this catastrophe, Trunks vows to stop them at any cost, though he laments the absence of additional assistance, particularly from the Xenoverse 1 hero, who is yet to return. Both Kai's are troubled by this prolonged absence, but they push the concern aside for now, as another time distortion requires immediate attention. Meanwhile, Frieza has been resurrected with the Dragon Balls, and now wields unprecedented power after training for the first time in his life. Don't you just hate that? You spend hours honing your skills, and then someone just comes along and they're just naturally good at it, and you're just like, fuck. <laughs> with his newfound strength, Frieza launches an invasion on Earth, driven by the desire for revenge against Goku. The sinister influence of Toa's time-changing schemes looms over the conflict once again, prompting us to unite with Earth's warriors and Jaco the Galactic Patroller to confront Frieza's formidable army. The Dragon Ball Super portions of the main story mode feel like a bit of an afterthought. They are quite a bit shorter than the other sagas, which is a bit disappointing because if anything they should have been more of a focus as they haven't been featured as much in other Dragon Ball games. I mean, did we really need three sections dedicated to the Frieza saga? But I guess when this game first came out, there wasn't that much content for Super yet. I keep forgetting this game came out in 2016. <laughs> With Jaco's assistance, we effortlessly dispatch the waves of Frieza's army. However, as Frieza finally emerges, we find ourselves facing him alone, as Jaco apparently departed at some point. Fucking abandon us. The battle against Frieza proves to be a prolonged and challenging affair, stretching on until Goku arrives in his Super Saiyan God Super Saiyan form. <laughs> a name that is quite a mouthful. <laughs> I am definitely in the camp where I think they should have called the Super Saiyan God form just Saiyan God, and then this form could have been called Super Saiyan God. Even the abbreviation. <laughs> It's so long. <laughs> it's like SSSJ, S, just Goku SSSJ. <laughs> As the battle rages on, Trunks attempts to communicate with us, but encounters interference on the comms when suddenly a new challenger approaches. Metal Cooler has returned, apparently because the Dragon Balls grant two wishes. I don't know. I think the devs just wanted him in the battle and couldn't think of a good reason. So they're just like, Dragon Balls? <laughs> The appearance of Cooler coincides with Vegeta's arrival, tipping the scales heavily in our favour with two of the series' most formidable characters by our side. Through the comms, we receive distressing news. Tolra and Mira have launched an assault on the Time Nest. The Supreme Kai of Time urgently contacts Wes and Lord Beerus, imploring them to intervene and eliminate the threat. After some negotiation, they agree to help him in exchange for Trunks' cream puffs. His cream puffs. Frieza, weakened and stripped of his golden form, unleashes a surge of energy, fueled by rage. In a swift turn of events, Trunks materializes and teleports us back to the time nest, just as Earth is obliterated. <laughs> just as Earth is obliterated. In the sanctuary of the time nest, we rendezvous with Wes and Beerus, who express irritation at being summoned without cause, let alone the promise of cream puffs. <laughs> it becomes clear that Toa manipulated the time nest communications to draw Beerus here. When Earth was destroyed in the correct history, we rewound time to restore it, but since the two of them are here, that can no longer happen. Well, in theory anyway, as there is no reason why they can't just go back and rewind time now. I mean, if you're just rewinding to the same point, it shouldn't matter when you start rewinding. Or maybe this isn't what they mean, and I just conveying it really badly. Beerus sees with anger, demanding to know Toa's whereabouts after realizing he's been deceived. The Supreme Kai of Time admits uncertainty, suggesting that fixing the alterations in history might draw them out, though it's merely speculation. Agreeing to help out, we take Wes back in time to rewind time, or is it the same point in time as before? Again, it's not conveyed that well. I'm just assuming that he's just going to rewind time, because that makes more sense. We materialize just before Frieza's catastrophic destruction of the planet, unleashing a powerful key blast to thwart his plans. Frieza and Cooler both transform into their supervillain forms, but even combined, they prove no match for our trio. Following the battle, we reconvene with Beerus in the Time Nest, where his frustration mounts since Tolhod never showed up. So in order to relieve Beerus' stress, we must fight him along with Whis, and then they both bugger off. Because the plot needs to get rid of them since they are just too powerful and remove all tension from the fights. <laughs> Having a conversation with Trunks at the Time Nest, it becomes apparent that there hasn't been any recent changes in history. 
Trunk speculates that Toa might be scheming something, prompting us to join him in the time vault to inspect the scrolls. Elder Kai shares Trunks' unease about the lack of activity. The revelation that the Marsane is none other than Goku's father Bardock adds to the tension. The Supreme Kai of Time refuses to believe that Bardock willingly serves Mira, suspecting he's under some kind of mind control. Deciding not to wait idly, the Time Patrol resolves to take action in an attempt to free Bardock. Utilising a time scroll, we journey to age 737, just moments before Toa and Mira snatch Bardock. Following them through a wormhole, we find ourselves in an unfamiliar age, resembling Earth, but reduced to ruins. Suddenly Toa appears, prompting Trunks to launch a direct attack, only to be intercepted by the brainwashed Bardock. Toa, hailing from our own timeline, anticipates our arrival, knowing it was only a matter of time before we traced her steps here. Trunks, focusing the assault on Bardock, hopes to liberate him from his mind control, recalling a similar success in the past. However, Mira soon joins the flight to aid Bardock. Engaging Trunks, Mira questions the frequency of their encounters, vowing to bring an end to their clashes, a sentiment echoed by Trunks. Toa discusses harnessing their energy to revive the demon realm, confirming Trunks' suspicion about their nefarious plans. Revealing Mira's increased strength due to the absorbed energy, Toa expresses doubt about our chances of victory. In a climactic showdown, we ultimately defeat both Mira and Bardock, shattering Bardock's mask in the process. However, Toa creates a wormhole beneath us, a portal leading to dimensions between dimensions, a one-way trip. Just as we are about to be pulled in, Bardock, now freed from Toa's control, blasts us out of the wormhole. What the? Bardock? I can't... I can't shake him off! How oh, is he so strong? Don't! How can... How can someone so weak overpower me? How dare you make a fool of me? This time, it's not about the Saiyans. Even my son Kakarot. I'm here for payback! Never underestimate a Saiyan's power! Get ready! How could I, by the likes of you? Overwhelmed by the loss of Mira, Toa collapses to her knees in shock. Disgusted with herself for Mira's failure and the wasted energy invested in strengthening him, she refuses to surrender so easily. Suddenly the Xenoverse 1 hero appears beside her, donning a mask akin to Bardock's. Toa discloses she captured the hero while they were pursuing Mira and explains how she gained access to the timeless communications earlier. I'm gonna be honest, I was kinda of expecting something like this to happen, but it's actually a good twist because it makes sense. <laughs> it's not just some ass pull to shock the player. A lot of people think a good plot twist is something that they didn't see coming, but actually a good plot twist is something you should have seen coming, and Xenoverse 2 did this aspect of the storytelling really well. Actually, the storytelling is far better than the first game. The villain's motives are properly established, your goal is clear, and it doesn't feel like half of the characters have nothing to do, which was quite a bit of an issue with the Supreme Kai of Time in Xenoverse 1. Most of the time she was just kind of hanging around. After a hard fought battle, we succeed in defeating the Xenoverse 1 hero, causing their masks to fall off and breaking free from Toa's mind control. Enraged, Toa bitterly declares that she's going to start from a clean slate and disappears. Shortly thereafter, the Xenoverse 1 hero starts to fade before disappearing out of existence. Despite witnessing this, Trunks and our character are left with no memory of Xenoverse 1, and it is as if Xenoverse 1 never ever happened, and everyone lived happily ever after. The end. Okay, fine. They just lose memory of the hero, not the whole game, unfortunately.
We returned to age 852, carrying the mask left behind after the battle. Surprisingly, even the Supreme Kai of Time and Elder Kai seem to have no recollection of the Xenoros One's hero's existence. When Trunks attempts to recall what happened in age question mark question mark question mark, he simply assumes that we are his partner. Suddenly, simultaneous shifts occur in all of the scrolls, signifying a profound change in history. The Supreme Kai of Time, Elder Kai and Toki Toki carefully examine the stack of time scrolls. Trunks inquires about their progress in the investigation. The Supreme Kai of Time admits they haven't uncovered any leads yet, but she suspects that a significant event must have been altered to cause such a dramatic change in history. However, she's unable to recall the specifics of the alteration, making it even more challenging to pinpoint. Suddenly, they recall the mask retrieved from the recent battle with Toa. Trunks attempts to recollect who it belonged to. Initially he considers Bardock, but quickly dismisses the notion, realising it belonged to someone else. Eventually he remembers his partner. It's kind of disappointing how quickly this memory loss is resolved, almost to the point that it's kind of a non-issue. And it's not even explained why Trunks and the others can remember a history that never happened. Well, I guess Goku done the same thing in the first game, but that's not a good reason. <laughs> Now just realising what Toa meant by starting off with a clean slate, Trunks locates the scroll to age 850, revealing Toa's acts of slaying Shenron before he could grant the wish that summoned the Xenoverse 1 hero. The time vault begins to convulse violently, threatening to collapse alongside the entire universe. With time running short, we hurry to confront Toa in age 850, while Trunks remains behind to assist in stabilising the situation. Toa is taken aback by an unexpected pursuit, as she hadn't anticipated us following her to this extent. She remarks that erasing the Dragon Balls from history should have altered the outcome of our previous battles and reshaped everything. Trunks from the past, determined to prevent further vandalization of Toki Toki City, joins us in the battle against Toa. The disappearance of the Xenoverse 1 hero from the timeline sheds some light on the need to correct the distorted timelines encountered in the first half of the game. Initially, I wondered about the specific entry points in the timelines and whether the distortions were occurring anew after the Xenoris 1 hero had already rectified them. However, upon closer examination, it seems the game wasn't aiming for such intricate storytelling. While it does provide a certain level of coherence, further thinking reveals inconsistencies. If the Xenoris 1 hero truly vanished from time, it raises the question about their involvement during the Saiyan Saga and the resolution of Demogra's threat. Was there another figure who thwarted Demogra, or was he never released at all? If we follow this premise, Toki Toki City wouldn't have been destroyed, so why does Kanton City still exist? Despite these narrative gaps, the overall story of Xenoverse 2 surpasses its predecessor in almost every way. Although the beginning may feel like a retread, the plot gains momentum after the midpoint. Yet Xenoverse 2's reluctance to diverge significantly from the source material hampers its potential. It is at its best when it's doing its own thing. Eventually we manage to force Toa to retreat and Trunks states that they could use strength like ours and hope someday that a certain someone shows up. Upon our return to the Time Nest, everything appears to have returned to normal. However, the Supreme Kai of Time sternly reminds us that the battle isn't over as long as Toa remains a threat. Suddenly, Toa appears and attacks the Supreme Kai of Time from behind. Toki Toki screeches at her after noticing Toa has stolen the Time Egg. Elder Kai states it should be impossible for Toa to even enter the Time Vault as the Time Nest is protected by a powerful barrier. However, Toa reveals the mask was part of a trap to allow her to infiltrate the Time Nest in order to steal Toki Toki's egg which contains enough dormant energy to revive the demon realm, allowing her to rule time and space once more. She uses some of the egg's energy to open a wormhole, allowing Mira to escape from the rift that Bardock had managed to trap him in. Toa then creates another wormhole in order to leave the time vault.
We confront Mira and Toa in an unknown era. Mira, enhanced and displaying a newfound vigor, exceeds Toa's projections. Despite Mira's augmented prowess, we gain the advantage in the battle. Toa cautions Mira about the risk of overheating, which could lead to the destruction of Universe 7. Consequently, she reluctantly teams up with us to thwart Mira's rampage. Mira then unleashes his supervillain form. Although this showdown with Mira serves as a climactic battle of the story mode, it unfolds much like any other encounter. While the combat mechanics are engaging and enjoyable, I can't help but notice the absence of certain mechanics particularly those introduced in the Expert Missions. Expert Missions are introduced following the South Saga, or is it the Boo Saga? No, it is the South Saga. They are challenging missions that can be completed with up to five other players. The enemy's unique abilities provide the majority of the challenge, like turning allies against you and unleashing gigantic key blasts. And I don't get why they didn't try to incorporate some of these mechanics into the story mode fights to make the final bosses feel more like final bosses. <laughs> With Toa's help, we are able to take Mira down. However, Mira is undeterred and plans to increase his strength even further by absorbing Toa. M Mira! But I... I was the one who made you! You turn on me? You're nothing but a failure! I'm getting an unusual energy reading. This feels wonderful. Hey, can you hear me? He absorbed all the power from Toki Toki's egg. There's nothing we can do to stop him now. Quickly! Escape is the only chance! It better not be Goku. It's a little too soon to start giving up. No. Don't do it. No. Why? Why do they constantly feel the need to have Goku appear and save the day? He has nothing to do with the story. Trunks should have shown up. They built it up throughout the narrative with Trunks making a few mistakes and at this moment he could have shown how much he has grown over the course of the story. It was perfectly set up, yet they don't do it. They'd done this in the first game too. It's just so frustrating. On a positive note though, I do quite like the design of Mira's final form. I think I like it because it looks a bit like Super Saiyan 4, but if they were an alien. Oh wait, Saiyans are aliens. Eventually, with Goku's help, we manage to weaken Mira. Seeing an opening, Goku uses his dragon fist technique to pierce through Mira's body in order to remove Toki Toki's egg. And then we finish Mira off with a Super Kamehameha. <laughs> I wish we could have fought more. So, forgive me. Returning to Age 852 with Goku, Elder Kai assumes they will finally have some peace. Though Trunks states it will only be for a little while, as someone is bound to appear and alter history. Meanwhile, the Supreme Kai of Time and Toki Toki are trying to protect Toki Toki's egg from Goku, who wants to eat it, because this is the super version of Goku, who is an idiot. Because I don't understand sex! The Supreme Kai of Time reveals the egg is ready to hatch soon, and that they are about to witness the birth of a new universe. Goku hopes there will be tough fighters in this new universe, causing the Elder Kai to steal the words right out of his mouth, Feeling pumped up, right? I really like getting pumped. And then everyone laughs. <laughs> the end. Right? No. Xenoverse 2 is like Xenoverse 1. It kind of 
keeps going. After the credits, a party is being held to celebrate the hatching of Toki Toki's egg. Suddenly the sky goes dark as Shiran has been summoned. The Supreme Kai of Time wishes for a feast because apparently nobody learned anything from the Shadow Dragon arc in Dragon Ball GT. Or did that not happen anymore? I don't know. <laughs> After the feast, Goku is amusing over who is the strongest amongst the group. Trunks thinks it's him since he has been at it the longest, but we suggest that they fight in order to find out, which is what Goku was hoping for. However, Beerus interjects, suggesting the Xenoverse 2 and Xenoverse 1 hero should battle instead, leading to a light-hearted amusement at Goku's expense, as he complains about not being allowed to join in the fun, and then everyone laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> The end. But not really, as there's still a little bit more to the story. Now, if you're like me after watching this ending, you're probably wondering what the hell happened to Bardock. I mean, they built him up to be the big plot relevant character, but then he quite literally just disappears from the game. What happens after he drags Mira into the void? Well, thankfully there is a hidden saga we can play through, but first we must unlock it because it doesn't automatically become available after completing the main story. Remember those extra rifts in Canton City that are completely optional? Well, they aren't completely optional if you want to play through the final segment of the story. From each of the five rifts, you can receive a distorted time egg. These eggs were Toa's attempt at recreating artificial versions of Toki Toki's eggs. When multiple distorted eggs are together, they can produce time distortions that can alter history based upon strongly held desires. These can be a bit tedious to collect, especially one from the Guru since you have to do all of the missions twice, but you can mitigate this tedium by doing the quest as you progress through the main story, which I didn't do because I didn't know. <laughs> By bringing all five eggs to the Supreme Kai of Time and then talking to Trunks, you will unlock the final two fights. And these are a bit different from the rest as you will not be playing as your custom character. The wormhole that Bardock drags Mirror into leads to the crack in time. At least I think that's where it is. It looks the same. That's my evidence. <laughs> it looks the same, so that must be where it is. In this showdown, we step into the shoes of Bardock, experiencing firsthand the events that transpired before Mirror's resurgence. As the fierce combat unfolds, Mirror grows increasingly perplexed by Bardock's ability to outmatch him despite his superior power level. Throughout the confrontation, Bardock undergoes a transformation, ascending from Super Saiyan to Super Saiyan 2 and ultimately reaching Super Saiyan 3. Mira, taken aback by his transformation, is swiftly overpowered by the Super Saiyan 3 Bardock. Yeah! Following the battle, Mira regains consciousness only to find Bardock mysteriously absent. Mira reveals that he always wondered what it would feel like to lose, and that he now understands the thing that Bardock and the others had that he didn't. A crippling fear of failure. Just me. Back at the Time Nest, they are surprised that Bardock had such power that he could overcome Mira. However, there is still the question of what happened to Bardock after the battle. The game does ask you whether you think he disappeared or is fighting somewhere else. I'm not sure how much your answer matters, but in the terms of the main story, the ultimate fate of Bardock remains a lingering mystery. Moving forward, we embark on the final battle in the main storyline, building upon the events of the Desperate Future Saga. Trunks is preoccupied with a separate task assigned by the Supreme Kai of Time, leaving us to venture into the Time Vault alone. With another alteration in history unfolding, the Supreme Kai of Time opts to grant us a glimpse into the modified timeline before swiftly taking action to rectify it. In the altered timeline of Age 780, we witness future Trunks about to join Gohan in the battle against the androids. However, we stop him, and Gohan faces the androids alone, willingly risking his life. Taking control of Gohan, we must face off against Android 17 and 18, mirroring the original history. But suddenly, Super Saiyan Trunks appears, defying the Supreme Kai of Time's orders to save his mentor. One of the main issues with the story mode in Xenoverse 1 was I found it hard to get invested in anything that was going on. And admittedly, I was feeling a bit like this with Xenoverse 2. However, as the game went on, it got a lot more interesting and I was actually looking forward to playing through the sagas. The better storytelling definitely helps with this, but also the far more enjoyable gameplay. I didn't feel like I was slogging my way through annoying fights just to witness an underwhelming cutscene in an underwhelming story. While I wouldn't consider Xenoverse 2's story to be anything amazing, I am glad that I finally got around to playing it, which I can't say the same for the first game. Thanks to Trunks' intervention, Gohan survives his fight against the androids and is finally able to avenge all his fallen comrades. 
Gohan expresses his gratitude for the peace they've secured, looking forward to a moment of respite now that the weight of the world is lifted from his shoulders. Trunks too shares in the sentiment, however he then admits his actions were unforgivable, driven by his desire to prevent history from repeating the tragedies of his future timeline. Trunks assures Gohan he has no regrets, proud that their actions saved the world. They discuss future threats like Cell and Boo, with Trunks revealing his knowledge of the future events to safeguard their world. They should make a game based on this timeline's ending. That would be cool. Back in Age 852, the Supreme Kai of Time reveals the timeline alterations stem from Trunks' intervention with future Gohan. While she acknowledges the potential for a peaceful future, Elder Kai warns of the dangers of leaving such changes unchecked. Again the game gives us a dialogue option but it ultimately doesn't matter as the final decision is up to the Supreme Kai of Time. The uncertainty lingers over whether she chose to mend or preserve the altered timeline. Regardless, Trunks reappears in the time nest, suggesting the timeline may have been corrected, indicating the existence of an alternate version of Trunks, resulting from the timeline distortion. The end. Well, not really. But that is a story for another video. So everyone laugh. <laughs> 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 okay, I'm done.